Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining me on Leading Our Own Way. Really appreciate you coming back every week. And there's quite a few of you, and I appreciate it. However, today's guest, Michelle Steiner, all the way from Pennsylvania, USA, uh, about half an hour away from Pittsburgh. That's about four or five hours, I've been told, from uh, the famous city of Philadelphia. Um, Michelle has grown up with a disability, and she is doing amazing things, but she struggled in her childhood, dealing with this disability, with peers being bullied by people at school, uh, struggling with teachers and the persona and the perception that kind of goes away around having a neurodiverse disability. Um, Michelle doesn't, she discusses, and these are her words that she discusses that, you know, she doesn't look like she has a disability, but the, the problems that come along with that. She's leading her own way in many, many different ways from writing a book, being a paraeducator um, and, and having a loving husband and a beautiful life that she leads every single day and giving back to the world by doing other podcasts and, and, and writing blogs and mainly just advocating for herself. It's a powerful episode. It's a powerful chat. And I really, really enjoyed meeting Michelle. And um, I think we'll keep it in contact. And it's uh, amazing to hear her journey. Um, a lot of you um, could take a lot away from this episode also. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast uh, wherever you get your uh, podcast from. 17% uh, of you who subscribe um, listen to this. Uh, the rest of you don't subscribe. So please, please subscribe um, for those who are listening. Just press that button. It really, really helps me out and I appreciate your time. Anyway, we'll be back after the intro with Michelle. See you shortly. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. I'm your host, Andrew White, and this is the podcast that unveils captivating narratives of resilience and personal triumph. This podcast is for anyone seeking inspiration and insights on overcoming life's challenges. Follow and subscribe, and then we can lead together forever. Good morning, Michelle. How are you today? Great, Andrew. How are you this morning? I'm, I'm good. It's uh, my evening, nine o'clock, and oh. I believe it's uh, seven a.m. for you. Can you can you tell us a little bit where you well where, where where are you in the world, Michelle? I'm in the United States. I live in Pennsylvania. Yeah, Very cool. So, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. And um, I know the major city of Pennsylvania is uh, what, Philadelphia, isn't it? That is. That's correct. How far are you from Philly? We're about five hours from Philly, or oh, about five far. to six hours. Yep. Oh wow! Yeah. Because just perspective, like Australia. I'm, I'm as, as you know, I'm uh -huh. from Manchester, England, but Australia is massive. So five to six hours to the city. Is, is, is there another major city near you other than? Yes, we live yeah. about an hour from Pittsburgh. Oh, Pittsburgh! So, yeah, I always forget about yeah. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Sorry about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Well, Michelle, thanks for joining us on uh, Leading Our Own Way. Really appreciate you waking you know. up early to join us because I know it's your school holidays. You are in education, <laughs> uh, but I'll let, I'll leave that to you. But thanks for joining me on my journey. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Michelle. Well, my name is Michelle Steiner. I live with my husband Ron, our two cats, Jack and Sparrow. I am a writer, a speaker, and photographer, and paraeducator, and I work in a school with students who have disabilities, and I get that opportunity to be able to help them with their work and just to uh, reinforce and encourage, uh, encourage them. And I also am a writer and speaker, and I have a blog called Michelle's Mission where I write about life with a learning disability, mm -hmm. and I feature my photography on my many walks. That's amazing. You, you've got, sounds like you've got a very full on life, if I'm honest. Yes, <laughs> definitely. I, I typically, I say, again, I, I do repeat myself. I do this every week, but mm -hmm. uh, the title of the podcast, as you know, is leading our own way. Bit of a mouthful. Um, but how would you consider how you're leading your way today? I think one of the ways that I'm learning to lead my way is ha having a disability. Oftentimes, uh, the world is uh, not designed for a person with a disability. We have a, a world designed for people who are neurotypical. And I feel like I'm just really trying to do the best I can to be able to live, to be able to work, and, and to be able to do all of that with having a disability. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, that, that word neuro has come a lot more prevalent, mm -hmm. hasn't it, over the last few years. I, I, maybe I've opened my mind to it a little bit more because, as you can see, I've got a lot of brain books on my shelf and I've yes. gone down the route of 
reading a lot around neuroscience, um, human biology, um, neurology. I actually interviewed a neurologist uh, that hasn't come out yet um, up in uh, Michigan. Uh, your end of the Mm -hmm. world, uh, Northern Michigan. And it's fascinating. Um, And it's something I think that we don't think about often enough. You know, it's some, it's, we, we think about our muscles, we go to the gym, we work out on at the gym, we can see our muscles Mm -hmm. improving, but for that one major muscle that we don't, we can't see, we don't, I don't feel like we look after too much or consider, do we? What, what do you, what's your thoughts around that? Right. A lot of times, I mean, yeah, it, we, we go to the gym, we can see the muscles improve. We know if we use weights, that'll help to strengthen them. And if we do other things uh, with cardio, that'll strengthen our heart. But a lot of times people don't think about their brain and they don't think about how the body and the brain are connected too. Oh. I can remember when I was in college, right before I would go to class or I would take a test. If I went to the gym and I worked out right before that, I understood so much more information than if I, if I just stopped, if I didn't do that. So I think it's all connected. And a lot of people just don't think, well, how is this affecting my brain? How is this affecting my learning? And Mm. there's a lot to that. Yeah. I like how you said it before about neurotypical as well. Um, Mm -hmm. What, what do you think differs from neurotypical to say some of the things that you, why you're doing what you're doing today, then how, how do they differ for you? And why uh, do you, why do you believe we don't cater for neurodiverse or whatever? What is the, what is the, mo- what is the best word to use? Would you say? Right. Well, I think a lot of times in, in my case, how the world isn't, there's a lot of emphasis, especially in Western culture put on math and a lot of spatial awareness skills. And those are things I really struggle with. And it's sometimes considered if you don't understand how numbers work and you have dyscalculia, people might look at you and think, well, why can't you understand that? Uh, This is supposed to add up. These numbers don't change. So a lot of times people don't get that. Uh, But just even certain things in our culture are changing. If I, uh, for example, I cannot read the face of a clock for the time I was very young and I can remember people saying, well, there's a clock over there. You're always not always going to have a digital clock to read. And now I look at it, I use my Fitbit or I'll be able to use a lot of our appliances now are all digital, which makes my life so much easier. So I can, I can see how that has shifted, but a lot of times people just really praise your, your student that goes into school that can get good grades does not struggle with learning and can just follow what a teacher's instructions are without having a lot of differences. They, they have good handwriting. They can get A's on their things. And if you have a student sometimes who comes into the classroom that is, you know, isn't neurotypical, they're going to, their brain's going to need different ways to be able to learn and to be able to grow in order to succeed. Uh, the ways other people might have a lot of struggles, especially some of my friends who have autism or ADHD, sometimes it's social cues, they can't read somebody's facial expressions, or uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is people that have autism or some other developmental disabilities trying to keep and maintain employment. We have a rate of 70% of people with disabilities are, are not employed in the United States, And just sometimes that's, they don't know how to ask for accommodations at work and other places go in and they're saying, well, I don't know what to give them. So sometimes it's that. And then even in relationships, it can be really hard. If somebody, sometimes uh, people just don't want to be with you because you have a disability. I experienced that. And other times it can be uh, that sometimes they just don't have the social skills to, to meet somebody or to maintain a relationship. And that can be really hard. Transportation is difficult, especially in the United States. We are definitely lacking on, uh, if you don't drive, how to have accessible transportation to go places. So that that can be hard because everybody is so accustomed to getting in their car in the morning and driving somewhere. And if you're someone who can't do that, employment can be difficult. Uh, Socially, it can be. And just sometimes a lot of people just look at me and they'll sometimes... uh, They'll think, oh, you don't look like you're disabled. Why can't you do this? And I have to explain to them that uh, I do have a disability and just you're not able to see a lot of them. 
Yeah. Wow. You've just taught me a few things and we'll, we'll, we'll delve into your, into mm-hmm. your disability shortly, because I think that um, people are probably thinking what you've just said, right. And, and how well you talk and how you get your message across. People might be wondering and thinking the same thing you've just mentioned, but you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I, I work in the classroom every day mm-hmm. and um, you just mentioned about the clock and, um, sometimes older children do and i'm guilty of it i'll openly admit you know sometimes they'll say to me because we have the analog clocks on the wall we don't have digital clocks in bed embedded in the walls unless they're wearing right. fitbits and whatnot um or watches digital watches but some children who i might have preconceived as just being lazy because we do live in a world where um how do i say it um children are just looking for the answers but adults right. give them the answers and don't get mm-hmm. them to work out for themselves so that that messy middle trying to figure out who genuinely right. can't work it out and the ones who are being lazy not lazy but the way they're brought up it's not their fault but the way they're brought up that you know they've been given maybe the answers on a plate left right and center i do sometimes turn around and say well there's a clock up there <laughs> um take what, what do you think and i try and put it back onto them obviously i do it with respect and i I'm, i don't right. diminish their feelings or emotions I'm, I'm very careful and mindful of all of those aspects of course mm-hmm. um how do we so how do we figure that out how do we what does the world look like do you think i mean well actually well i've told you just taught me a lesson mm-hmm. that was my point though so i'm going to be more mindful now <laughs> it's okay yeah no no it's great though i'm glad you've said it because I've never looked at it. It's never, it's not entered my head to think what happens if that child has a, has a disability or is unable to read that clock because it's not digital. Right. I've not been educated in that sense. I have now because you've just done it for me. So that's right. powerful stuff. But um, coming away from that then, what is, what would you say has changed over the years because we be- seem to be more aware of the neuro neurodiverse communities mm-hmm. uh, i'm actually having a pre-chat with somebody with uh, neurodiverse um he has a business and i mean i'm pre-interviewing oh. him next week here in australia i met him at my son's school believe it or not yes. uh, so fascinating so we're, we're going to have another call uh, another guest who can connect with you pretty mm-hmm. well he's in uh, created a, like a computer game gaming scenario business and he goes around and teaches schools how children can (laughs) benefit from these type of games opposed to just playing on them all day and 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 wasting time right so right sorry i've just rambled there this is um not but i I felt like it was quite interesting to get that across but um have you noticed it changed over the years uh, and people being more aware and if so how have we changed as a society as a world I think we've, we have definitely a lot more awareness. A lot of times parents are more aware of what to look for in their children. I also think teachers are more aware of what's going on and referring to things to that as that understanding. I also just, just think that in some ways there are just a lot of the technology has come a long way too. I can remember my handwriting has always been horrible and people would think that was a character flaw when I was in school or I had to learn. And I'm not against anybody trying to teach somebody handwriting or multiplication or the, uh, even reading a face of a clock. Mm. But I just think that some, once I learned how to type, it was so much better for me. And I think that we have to be teaching those skills and working at them. But if it's not working, let's try doing something else for them that does work. It's more effective because I can, yeah, there's just certain things that I can, uh, that you can sit me down and have me try to do. And I I just can't get that. So I think a lot of people have that understanding and there's a lot more resources and technology than even whenever I was in school. And I think that's important. And also services. Sometimes uh, there are services now that kids will come in in the States and if they're demonstrating some fine motor issues, they'll, they'll provide occupational therapy right at the school. So that wasn't something that I got, but a lot of our kids have now or they have that option when, when they're younger. Uh, another thing that has that I have seen change is how uh, disability services have changed in our schools. And in some ways, it's a good thing. In other ways, it's not quite so beneficial. Uh, a lot of places don't have a, a, a learning support classroom for, for math. That's where I had what I had to do because 
I never made it outside of learning support uh, successfully whenever I was in school. Mm -hmm. Now we have students, they're going into a basic gen ed class with accommodations. And it's not that that can be really hard when you have a student that can't read and you put them in a science or a social studies class. Well, they're going to act up. And I'm usually pretty good at identifying when a kid is being bad or, or displaying that kind of behavior to go over and think, wow, this kid can't read. And dramatically, I would just very suddenly be like, OK, do you need me to read this to you? And like, yeah. And. It, it didn't change the whole situation, but it, it made a little bit of a, some understanding at that point. So I think that's changed a, a lot. I think um, how we transition students before they leave high school has changed too. I did have some people come and talk to me from an agency before I left, but now we really start uh, rolling the, you know, getting that ball rolling by the time that they're in seventh grade about what do you want to do? when you leave because a lot of our students their disabilities they're, they're going to leave us and graduate but their disability isn't going to leave them so we have to start looking into how we can help them become happy healthy successful adults yeah you've, you've touched on quite a few points there to be fair mm -hmm. and i think we you have the mindset and the open uh, the, the knowledge and the background to be able to go in with that mindset into each class when you can see a child acting up. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the behavior isn't the problem. The behavior is the expression of the problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think we, we can have more individuals like you. I was speaking to somebody today about, you know, where schools can have a counselor at schools, uh, a mm -hmm. counselor at every school. That's beautiful. That's great. And I'm not saying we don't do that. We absolutely should do that. However, I think we need to go to the top of, top of the chain. I think we do need to in, introduce, um, you know, brain scanning to children mm -hmm. to understand yep. and to see the map of the source, the book. I mean, I've read the book, The Source. I mm -hmm. think that is the first point we have to go to. But that aside, if that's not doable, it, we train teachers, but it's like driving a car. You're driving, a, you learn the lessons, but you only really learn to drive a car once you pass your test because you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You don't have anyone there to touch the brakes or support you and guide you. You have to do it on your own. It's like teaching in, in schools, at university, you get taught. It's, it's great. I'm not saying it's not useful, but they seem to forget about it when they start the job. And it's like, oh, I've just done all of that, but it's actually not. It's not teaching them a connection and relationships. We should be using those four years to be teaching them about the brain and yeah. human biology and trauma and and i'm not saying they're all going to work in traumatic school trauma informed backgrounds necessarily but we, if we can understand the brain at a deep level and sleep and food we we're gonna we're gonna eliminate problems where these kids might fall into a rut or a hole of that behavior in that science lesson like you've just said let's stop teaching them science for the sake of ticking a box to meet the curriculum let's get the human skills in place let's get the as you mentioned before, yes. understanding if they can read, if they can understand if they can write or not. And if they right. can't after a certain period of time, maybe, maybe there's something deeper. But if they have that awareness going into the job, right. they'll, they'll, they'll get found earlier on, won't they? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, I know. If we can just get them at that young age, yeah, at that very young age, that would be so much more beneficial. Yeah, it's uh, just kills me when we have to tick boxes for the sake of ticks and boxes and the, the, the whole of growth keeps getting bigger and bigger and they keep falling deeper into it. Um, what, so is, tell, tell us a little bit of then, so we've got a bit of context. What is, uh, let's talk about your disability then. Yes. If that's sure. Okay. I have a dyscalculia, which is a math learning disability. I was diagnosed in kindergarten, but whenever I was diagnosed, it was more of an umbrella term. We didn't have um, a lot of those terms along with that. We we just we knew it was a learning disability. I wasn't going to be a math uh, mathematician whenever I was uh, five or six years old. We knew that, but uh, my teacher could really tell in the classroom I was really struggling with um, just trying to figure out how numbers worked. I couldn't tie my shoes. I had a hard time with counting. Uh, visual perception was also really difficult. I, I can just remember trying to get, I would do a dot to dot worksheet and I thought, oh, I'm doing a really good job. And whenever I would do it, I would, it wouldn't be correct. Mm -hmm. And I was my parents' first child, so they didn't have a lot to base development on. So they recommended that I, uh, the school recommended that I get tested and my parents went along with it. And sure enough, I, I do have one. 
I had to repeat kindergarten the following year and I began to receive uh, specialty instruction and I, uh, it was just really frustrating uh, socially and academically. I quickly started to uh, be labeled as the the kid, the, the outcast. Um, I went to a very small school district and I couldn't hide the fact that I had a disability. Everybody knew that I went to learning support and it, it, those years were really difficult for me. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.